Hey, I wanted to very quickly talk about um, something interesting. I was talking to my best friend earlier today, and somehow we came on to the topic of like Steve Jobs and his reality distortion field. And I thought, oh yeah, that'd be really something interesting to share with other people because I think it's kind of strange, also kind of fascinating. So. Um, it comes from this book, Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson. Uh, this is like the definitive biography on him. Uh, towards the end of his life, he knew he was dying. And so he kind of gave uh, Walter Isaacson like unprecedented access into his life um, for this biography. But the reality distortion field was something that came from like his strong-willed personality where when other people believe something wasn't possible, he did not. He didn't accept uh, limitations or boundaries. And this led, of course, to his success and Apple's success as a company, his unwillingness to accept no for an answer. Uh, there are some downsides to it as well, but um, I wanna read some from chapter 11 just to kind of give you an idea of the uh, the reality distortion field and how it works <laughs> okay so this is chapter 11 the reality distortion field of uh, playing by his own set of rules and I guess that was like what he did um, sort of like his entire life uh, so reading from this um, when Andy Hertzfeld joined the Macintosh team he got a briefing from Bud Tribble a software designer about what they wanted done and how Jobs wanted the Macintosh finished by January of 1982. Uh, Andy does not believe this is possible. And uh, Tribble says that Jobs would not accept contrary facts. He says, quote, the best way to describe the situation is a term from Star Trek, unquote. He says, Steve has a reality distortion field. When Hertzfeld looked puzzled, Tribble elaborated in his presence, reality is malleable. He says, uh, he can convince anyone of, any, of practically anything, but it wears off when he isn't around. But it makes it hard to have realistic schedules. So um, the reality distortion field is something that uh, you you kind of have to be around him and in his presence in order for it to be effective, right? And that's because of the power of his magnetic personality. So it continues. Um, uh, Tribble recalled he adopted the phase from the Menagerie episodes of Star Trek in which a group of aliens create a new world through the sheer power of mental force. He meant it as a compliment. He thought it was a compliment. Quote, it was dangerous to get caught in Steve's distortion field, but it was what led him to be able to actually change reality. Um, at first, Hertzfeld thought that Tribble was exaggerating, but after a few weeks of working with Jobs, he became a keen observer of the phenomenon. Quote, the reality distortion field was a confounding melange of a charismatic rhetorical style an indomitable will and an eagerness to bend any fact to the purpose at hand, he said. He says there was little that could shield you from the force. Amazingly, the reality distortion field seemed to be effective even if you were acutely aware of it. After a while, most of us gave up trying to get rid of it and just accepted it as a force of nature. Um, to some people, calling it a reality distortion field was just a clever way of saying that Steve Jobs tended to lie. It came from willfully defying reality, not just to others, but to himself. He can deceive himself, said Bill Atkinson. It allowed him to calm people into believing his vision because he has personally embraced and internalized it. Um, I think that's kind of fascinating. In a weird way, uh, continues. Um, it was a tactic for accomplishing something. Wozniak said, uh, "He says, quote, his reality distortion is when he has an illogical uh, vision of the future. 
such as telling me I could design the breakout game in just a few days. You realize that it can't be true, but somehow he makes it true, unquote. When members of the Mac team got ensnared in his reality distortion field, they were almost hypnotized. That's a really interesting thing because when you think about cult leaders and very charismatic people, you often hear like a very similar stuff. Quote, he reminded me of Rasputin, unquote, said Debbie Coleman. He laser beamed in on you and didn't blink. It didn't matter if he was serving purple Kool-Aid. You drank it, unquote. But like Wozniak, she believed the reality distortion field was empowering. It enabled Jobs to inspire his team to change the course of computing history with a fraction of the resources of Xerox or IBM. It was a self-fulfilling distortion, she claimed. You did the impossible because you didn't realize it was impossible. At the, re the root of his reality distortion was Jobs' belief that the rules did not apply to him. He had some evidence for this. In his childhood, he had often been able to bend reality to his desires. Rebelliousness and willfulness were ingrained in his character. He had the sense he was special. It goes on to say it's almost like Nietzsche. Jobs never studied Nietzsche, but the philosopher's concept of the will to power and the special nature of the uberman came to him naturally. As Nietzsche wrote and thus spoke Zarathustra, quote, the spirit now wills his own will, and he who had been lost to the world now conquers the world, unquote. If reality did not comport with his will, he would ignore it, as he had done with the birth of his daughter, and as he would do years later when he was first diagnosed with cancer. He acted as if he were not subject to the strictures around him. Another key aspect of his worldview was his binary way of categorizing things. People were either gods or an asshole. <laughs> uh, they were either the best, quote unquote, or totally shitty. So I think that that's kind of interesting in, in the way that he's thinking. And that, by the way, would change uh, like by the week. You know, one day you'd be an asshole and you were totally shitty. But the next week, you might be, like, uh, amazing and totally wonderful. It was just, like, the way that he operated. Um, yeah, so the categories were not immutable. He just had a, ten he had a tendency to resemble a high-voltage alternating current. Just because he tells you something is awful or great doesn't necessarily mean that he'll feel that way tomorrow. <laughs> um... If one time his argument failed to persuade somebody, he would deftly switch to another. Sometimes he would throw you off balance by suddenly adopting your position <laughs> as, it, as if it were his own, without acknowledging that he ever thought differently. That is so funny. But anyways, um, the reality distortion field was something that enabled him to make like these great innovations, like when... They were working on the Macintosh. He had an idea of how he wanted it to look. He wanted it to look a certain way, to uh, be a certain weight and size, to have a certain uh, boot up time. And, you know, a programmer came to him and said, look, this is what we have. This is our budget. Like, we're just not going to be able to do this. And he was somehow able to convince them through the sheer power of his uh, will and his determination that in fact it was possible and they ended up reducing the boot time by 28 seconds um, another time that this was helpful was when they were creating the iPhone he is really like he was really autistic about detail and like design and functionality he liked minimalism but he also liked things to look really nice and fancy, so he wanted to have a Gorilla Glass for the iPhone. So he meets with the CEO of Gorilla Glass, and he says, you know, I want to have this, I want as much Gorilla Glass as possible, I need this amount by this time. And the guy looks at him and says, that's not possible, like, we don't have enough uh, facilities open to create that. And he looks at the guy and he says, 
don't be afraid. <laughs> and he just tells them that, like, it is possible. And this guy ends up doing it in, like, four months. Now, the reality distortion field is bad and counterproductive when it comes to things like uh, not like becoming so arrogant that you can't accept reality, that you believe that somehow you, you now have the ability to alter reality, to bend reality and manipulate reality, which is what eventually happened to him over time. Uh, he became such a force of nature and he became so powerful that people were afraid to tell him the truth. They didn't want to argue with him, and I think that people were eager to please him. So he got to the point where he kind of believed his own hype, like his own bullshit. And when he got cancer, well, first of all, he had a really weird diet of, like, he'd only eat fruit, and he would do these weird, like, fruit juices or something, which, ew. But, like, that's obviously not good for your health. And then when he got um, pancreatic cancer... Uh, they, the doctors recommended that he get surgery right away, and that surgery could have saved his life. But he thought that he, if he ignored it or something, that it would go away or that he could, like, will it away with the power of his mind. That obviously didn't happen, so he waited nine months to get the surgery. He was doing things like acupuncture, uh, taking, like, organic herbal supplements or something, and, of course, um, that didn't work. So he ended up dying at 56 years old. And uh, I think that had he not um, listened to, had he not been fooled by his own distortion, reality distortion field, he probably would have lived. Um, but he got to the point where he started to believe in his ability to like manipulate reality that much that it ended up killing him. So what made him such an innovator and what made him such a successful business person in the end is what destroyed him. You know, he like destroyed himself. And there's also probably some lessons in here about like occultism, right? Like obviously Aleister Crowley believed in like developing the will and really you shouldn't be, uh, if you're a Christian, you should not be using your own will. You should desire to do God's will and you should allow that to guide you. So it's just some things to think about and something that I thought was kind of interesting.